Eric and boy, what a show I <laughs> have got with Michael Kester today. Yeah, it's gonna be a uh, gonna be a good one. What are the movies we're doing? We're doing Gummo and Pink Flamingos. Oh man! So I don't know what to call this culture yet, but uh, and I guess we'll we'll talk about it on the show itself. We'll kind of mm-hmm. get into the the deeper roots here. But I think this was sort of opposing views of kind of trash culture. Yeah, you know, that's something like that. Um, yeah. Of kind, of, I, I don't want to say poverty necessarily, yeah. but yeah. It's, it's somewhere. And I, I'm, and I trash also, seems too simple. I was well, and it seems to it seems a little offensive. Right. Well, um, there's the cynical look and there's the champion look. Yeah. And you can't. You know, the funny thing is, if I could say easily trash culture, I would say, oh, Pink Flamingos is the trash culture yeah, film. Yeah. Sure. What's but the that's trash the champion film. Bible. Right. <laughs> well, that too. Um, there's going to be spoilers. I don't know how many spoilers there's going to be because, uh, instead of doing prep today, I just watched the Um Shiniwam yeah. uh, video. <laughs> so we'll probably talk about that too. But, uh, I think we'll talk about that in the gummo section, yeah. which will be first. Right. So you can use the chapters in our show to skip over gummo if you haven't actually seen gummo. Uh-huh. And uh, you could skip Pink Flamingos if you hadn't seen that particular John Waters film. Yeah, because of all the John Waters films we've covered on Double Feature... Pink Flamingos is the one you haven't seen. Gummo was written and directed by Harmony Corinne. Who's a man. Yeah, Harmony Corinne, we have uh, we've not talked about uh, a ton on the show before, but strangely, we have covered. Yeah, well, and strangely, we have covered is probably the most understated uh, way you could have put <laughs> that. We covered him strangely. We uh, Harmony Corinne was the director, writer of uh, kids the writer of kids that was right. director larry clark right on who kids. we did talk about at length but yeah. harmony corinne was the writer of kids um just a notable um subversive filmmaker sure. has done a lot of uh films like gummo and like kids since then a lot of work with you know old chloe yeah right and uh Get and to talk about chloe again i'm excited <laughs> you know i love that yeah especially a movie where chloe looks like yolandi you're trying to distract me already i, I really i i have i think equal things to say about gummo and umshi and miwam oh God. We, we could have probably uh done just a double feature on that but it would have gone an hour and a half okay and before it we alienate less... everybody who doesn't know uh what you're talking about right I want to stick to the Larry Clark stuff a oh, little yeah. bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, Larry Clark. Well, I mean, okay. So this has nothing to do with Larry Clark today. Okay. But we threw kids on the show because we thought it was funny. Yeah. Uh, last something year. Something like that. And uh, <laughs> I mean, we had a great conversation. I really loved that show. I think we that threw kids on. Well. We threw kids on the show because we wanted to. We wanted to play the joke that had been played on us on everyone. Sure. Sure. But uh, when we did it, it was sort of a oh surprise. How many yeah. grin landed on our show? Right. I don't know how that took so long or. How he found a spot here. Yeah. Both of those things. Something were, like, yeah. R- right but, in the middle. So we're watching this now, and I want to I wanna compare it a little bit to kids, just because if everybody's been following along for all these years of Double Feature, yeah. they've seen kids previously. Sure. And uh, to contrast these two works, now Harmony's directing, not just writing. Right. This has nothing to do with Larry Clark. Mm-hmm. He's completely out of the picture. But I'm interested in how similar the the two films are. Well, I think in with a visual aesthetic and kind of um, you know the way that the the raw way that the shots sure. are told. <laughs> sure, sure. I think that there's a huge obvious comparison to the to the Larry Clark film mm-hmm. Kids. But the biggest difference for me is one. I think that Gummo paints far more of a portrait. Instead right. of telling any sort of a story, sure, sure. and uh, and I've actually I have a lot to say about that. But kids was, I mean, despite a lot of contention, kids did have a plot. Yeah, if only um, there's a narrative there. Sure, where there isn't as much here. Gummo absolutely has no narrative, right? Um, by design. I yeah, mean, well, that's... and I think by I think a lot of the theme of the film revolves around the fact that there is no narrative. Well, you don't create a fucking nihilistic movie and then give it a straightforward plot. Right. I mean, if you're gonna really do some justice to nihilism you're also going to say fuck plot we don't need plot I right mean, and if you're gonna if you're gonna hit 
a white trash town with a tornado, sure. they're not doing anything. Sure, yeah. What are they doing at that point? When yeah. you go through all of their homes and all of their businesses with yeah. a fucking natural disaster, right. they're going to spend right. weeks doing nothing. Yep. You can't follow a plot. I mean, the, the closest thing to a plot in the film is is wiping out cats. Sure. Which is sure. just this gross analogy yeah. to, you know, bringing people out of their shelter and now everybody's a fucking stray. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head when you said nihilistic portrait. You know, it's <laughs> sure. it's a film that is just about being. Yeah. And how when left to your own devices, your being can be your own downfall. Sure. Even when you're not doing anything, even if you're just surrounded by it. It's great that you can look at this and immediately see all those differences between kids because yeah. I was struck so much to go, you know, as a, a director centric person yeah. myself, uh, I see a Larry Clark movie and I see a Harmony Corinne movie and the fact they are uh, similar really in any way makes me go, uh, well, one was Harmony Corinne inspired by his work mm -hmm. with Larry Clark. But maybe more so is this just kind of a genre now, you yeah. know, this sort of independence. Well, I mean, it it goes back to the Bellflower thing about Mumblecore. Like, yeah, right. Again, I have no fucking idea what Mumblecore <laughs> Still is. Still no idea. Probably but never any this idea. This seems like something that I would call Mumblecore. Again, no oh, idea. Right, right. You did. I think kids came up in that conversation, yeah. if I remember. Um, yeah. But, you know, a film that I think draws a lot of parallels to Gummo, and, and this will be shocking probably just to you eric ingram but not to anybody in podmanity because sure. it's been probably at least eight days since we've mentioned rob zombie oh great is uh house of a thousand corpses really i feel like gummo and that film are both painting this picture of a place right and the people are in it but it's not the focus of the film sure okay. and if you you know you look at something like house of a thousand corpses it's you know the backwoods south and it's that house and it's sure you know, the murder ride and whatever. Although but these are two very different kinds sure. of self. Right, that's true. But uh, the House of a Thousand Corpses thing that also I think is a direct parallel is that, um, you do you remember how in House of a Thousand Corpses it jumps back and forth between, I want to say narrative, but for the sake of gumbo, I'm just going to say film and then short kind of almost testimonials of the crazy people that are around but that aren't involved in the filmmaking right there's the scene where the guy has his shotgun pointed at the camera and he's going on about you know aliens and the other scene where the woman and her husband are talking about how she had sexual relations with bigfoot sure gummo has that same thing where harmony corinne goes out finds people actually from this town yeah and basically turns the camera on and they beat the shit out of each other in their kitchen. <laughs> right. And it's just as fucked up and uncomfortable as the semi-scripted, you know, stuff with big name actors like Chloe Savini. Right. Big name actors like Chloe Savini. Comparatively. Maybe it's the Savini that's making me think Larry Clark too. But yeah, it's that environment, you know, it's the cheap poverty and the dirt and sure. uh, the morally bankrupt kids. Yeah. I guess. You already brought up one of the most impactful choices that sets this apart, though, and that is, I just want to call it nihilism. Yeah. Uh, can we just call it like filmmaking nihilism? Sure. But it's that lack of structure or yeah. that lack of narrative that kind of, you know, if you think about nihilism as there is no meaning, there's no points, and really, I, you know, I always think about nihilism pessimistically. I suppose yeah. you could have an optimistic take on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. But there just is nothing. And doing a film structurally to have no structure to it is uh, almost a tribute to the, the content of your movie. So we have this collection of scenes, and uh, when you think back to it, it kind of, I mean, it creates its own narrative uh, by force, really. Yeah. When you have a collection of scenes and you finish, I mean, I think the audience naturally goes, so what was that about? Well, yeah, and I think that that's, what I love about Gummo is that it does the thing that you and I love to talk about. It's a film that presents the audience with a bunch of art, a bunch of, you know, work, the product of days of planning and filming and sure. writing and whatever. And then it goes, okay, figure out what I'm saying. Yeah, right. Because right. it's there. I think that there, I think that Gummo says so much in, in its simplicity by not giving you a storyline. I feel like oftentimes giving somebody a plot is a way for half the audience to tune out to what the film is actually saying. Because if you have a plot, then when the film is over and the plot is resolved, 50% of an audience has seen the film. Yeah. It's the done. other 50% of the audience is still going to cook on it, find the themes, figure sure. out the why of the plot right. and why the characters do this and that. But 
a plot is just an easy scapegoat to make a film accessible. Sure. And you take that away, and that makes the film more difficult, but almost a deeper trip into the discovery of right. it for the viewer, if you give a shit. Well, okay, so let's do something a little dangerous then. I'm going to disregard this entire iPad full of notes here, because we've uh, we've kind of come up against something, the question of why. Yeah. I mean, when when you're done with the movie, you know... Uh, I, in, in Gummo, I think that, man, I think I was so floored by yeah, the time this sure. film ended. I had so much to say and so sure. much going on because... I mean, you and I, we're both humanists. We both sure. think, you know, thumbs up, go people. Yeah. And this film seems to be railing really hard at times against that. It does, And there yeah. are people, and I, I even hesitate to say characters because they seem like real human beings in the film that I feel like, and I don't mean this in a in the horrific way it sounds, but I think in the context of the film, there are people who are just a waste. Sure. The guy that I'm thinking of specifically uh, is the one who beats the shit out of the chair. Yeah, uh, right. loses the arm wrestling match. Yeah, right. Um, and he's why? Because he can't win an arm wrestling match. Right. Well, worthless. That's it. No. It, I mean, being. he's. What is he doing? You know sure. what? And that's kind of the question of the whole film: is what are these people doing? Right. You know, if you're looking at it from an acting standpoint, which I hate to do. So let's do it. What is their motivation? Right. Why are they doing this? And I think that the characters don't provide their own depth the way that actors tend to do. That you have um the lead who gets that long speech about how he's the poster child and he's like he could be a hero and he could really be somebody he's got all the makings of this sure and then you're introduced to him and you see that he's just fucking terrible right and that's when you realize that that's where you are sure you're in a world where this guy is the hero right and so everyone around him he is the one that they're kind of trying to be and that they hope to be and he's this picture of the next generation sure and you realize that the other kid, what's his name, Solomon, mm -hmm. he shows these signs of getting out of it and wanting to be more human and wanting to be, you know, something more than just stuck in this broken town. Right. But he's too busy being led in a generation whose leader is this fucking cat killer. Yeah. It's this sad image where you see, you know, a glimmer of potential in a dying city. Sure. And you realize that that glimmer is looking up to the end of it so right and i know i'm starting to talk really heady but <laughs> that's what i think the film presents to the viewer is um this idea that your surroundings and and um the it, society you live in right. really kind of sets some boundaries for what you can accomplish yeah and it's it's sad because a lot of people you know where our generation is particularly guilty where we grew up being told you can do whatever you want sure you can be whatever you set your mind to if you want it, you know, believe it, you can achieve it. Sure. And, you know, then the fucking financial problems or whatever hit and it becomes abundantly clear that you are still limited by yeah. where you are, who you were born to, what's around you, sure. who you know. The limitations start piling up. Yeah. And it's really jarring to a generation of people who are told, you know, believe in your dreams, follow your heart. Yeah. And it it's just a reflection on this whole society in gummo where there, you have this kid and he goes in and there's that scene that the one i always remember with cassie mm -hmm. you know the mentally handicapped girl who sure. her brother pimps her out and you have solomon i think his name is solomon good job you have solomon going in there and he's you know talking to her and do you love me and do you think i'm handsome sure and he's trying to create something real in this disgusting bubble right he's constantly striving to better himself he's constantly striving to find reality in these people but he's living surrounded by people that tell him you know get drunk beat up a chair have a sure. good time well even if you think about that scene you know the uh the don't smile i'm gonna kill you scene yeah which i mean that whole scene is really bizarre you have the kind of tap dancing mom figure and the malnourished kid yeah. pumping weights but she's telling him you know stop pumping all those weights look at how your shoulders yeah, are exactly. sticking out you know and then she starts dancing close up to the camera doing ostrich moves yeah so it's... that happens too feels like we're back watching um todd browning's freaks yeah. a little bit but yeah the thing i like so much about gummo is that it's uh it's in direct opposition to something like atlas shrugged right uh -huh. yeah i talk about atlas shrugged all the time as you know when we had that tv promise of follow your dreams yeah. and then society kind of sure. set the restrictions. Atlas Shrugged was always that thing I looked at as the 
the ideal, you know, that was the follow your heart kind of thing for me. Yeah. It was the business plan. It was the roadmap of success. Atlas Shrugged is a piece that basically says, uh, you know, all of these people are driven. It looks specifically at all of their motivations. And it says every single thing they do, it's the opposite of nihilism, yeah. really. So much so that it says, well, what if we create a society just of people who are driven? You know, what does that society look like? And then you turn and look at Gummo and it says, what if you're surrounded by people who do nothing? Yeah. You have no resources and you have, I mean, things like motivation come to mind for me for, um, uh, you know, when your peers are holding you up to something. Yeah. If you, I just uh, started watching the Aaron Sorkin thing, Newsroom. Oh, yeah, yeah. We really need to do more Sorkin on this show, by the way. the uh, We totally missed out on the social network because I wasn't even really aware of mm -hmm. the Sorkin thing, but just fucking magnificent writer. But seeing someone surrounded by people who are all trying to be the best at what they're doing, yeah, just by osmosis makes you fucking better. It, sure. it makes you driven. It makes you think about it all the time. It's like when all of your friends are into a particular movie, uh -huh. you know, it gets you excited about yeah. it. And that's the thing missing from Gummo. And that's the thing that makes it, I mean, this poor fucking kid, the fact that it looks like he's trying to achieve anything at all yeah. is a fucking miracle sure. compared to, you know... When he talks to anybody else about anything, they're just smashing his dreams, yeah. you know, left and right. I think if there's anything that drives any of these people, it might be self-image. Yeah. That seems to be the only thing they have, you know, sure. even uh, a word like concern about. I mean, what are these people concerned with? What yeah. are they, you know, it seems like even the, the basic elements of food, shelter, not important. No. To, there's really nothing that's important to them. Yeah, I, I think But it's... maybe taping up their boobs and shaving off their eyebrows sure. and- you know, that might be the only thing. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of what motivates these people is each other. And I think that's why it's a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, I think self-image is exactly what it is. I think they're out, you know, their houses are destroyed. They're out in their front lawns on lawn chairs and people they know are around and they, they sure. want to be okay. You know, they're just kind of bored and they're looking to everybody else. They're looking to the, for the first person who's going to start trying to rebuild. Sure. But they don't want to be that person because, I mean, again, you have everybody just knocking everybody down for yeah. trying to make any improvements. Right. And um, But you you mentioned earlier humanism. I sure. mean, I think we both start with the premise that people are basically good. Yeah. Most people are basically good. Yeah. Where is the good in these people? Well, I don't think that... Is it in there? I, yeah. I don't think that they're bad people. Mm -hmm. I think that they're... Um, just torturing animals and, you know, cutting off someone's life support. That, well, that, you know, that's all one guy. Yeah. And okay, like I said, okay. that's the guy that everybody is now looking up to. Yeah. Right. You have... It's, well, because he's the only one with any kind of drive. Yeah, even exactly. Even if it's in a negative direction. And it's it's this fantastic thought experiment where what if you have a bunch of uneducated decent human beings who are all being led by the one motivated evil human sure, being. sure something that gets me back to humanism though is i kind of feel like this is a real place right i mean yeah places like this really exist mm -hmm. don't they have you ever been anywhere that just uh you ever been around this this kind yeah. of i mean the poverty is one thing sure when i think about there's few times in my life very few times that i've been around in an environment like this but i have seen it yeah towns i've been to where i mean i hate to just pick on the south we champion the south all the time yeah. so that's fine but it's the the few instances i've been in the south in towns where there aren't a lot of people uh -huh. and it's just this kind of you know the idea me going down there and going great what are we going to do today what's on the agenda the word agenda i mean i right. might as well be speaking another language down there you know there's not to say down in the south but in these particular places i've been uh places in tennessee specifically sure outside the city in kind of Tennessee suburbs yeah. where no one has anything to do all day. Yeah. You kind of just get up and you do whatever is in front of you. You think moment to moment until eventually you go to sleep. It's a, um, it's a bleak and a depressing existence, but I think a movie like Gummo needs to exist to remind us it's there if we're not around yeah. it. Because it's important in a, in a representation of reality, not just to constantly go... Here's how life should be. Here's the fountainhead. Here's the ideal. Uh -huh. Here's what everyone should strive towards. But also once in a while to say, also this thing exists. Even if just to go, well, this is why we're driven. So right. this doesn't happen. Sure. Because that's the easy thing to happen. Right. 
that's what happens when we all stop being yeah. driven. You know, that's that's where we all live then. Well, and I think it's scary because it's all based on this idea that, I mean, we don't get to see the functionality of the town before it gets hit by a sure. natural disaster. And I think that that kind of nebulous idea of this could have been a functional town. Right. But at maybe this just point, so much apathy, you know, something yeah, catastrophic I mean, happens and no one cares to. Yeah. Pick it's up so crippling it. to imagine. I mean, just think about in your life. Think about you're here in Chicago, a fucking, I don't know, tornado, say, goes sure, through, sure. rips your apartment apart. What do you do? I mean, you, that for I can tell you for the first, at least for the first few hours, you go to a cafe and you sit there. Yeah, right. You do nothing yeah. is what you do. Well, I mean, there's the moment of shock and yeah. then there's that moment that's supposed to come afterwards of, all right, time to create a plan. Yeah. That's what you do after a fucking disaster. Sure. You go, this was terrible. Okay, now what? And the okay, now what doesn't seem to happen. Right. Instead, there's there's the crutches. There's... Uh, let's, you know, drink a beer and we'll wrestle a, wrestle a fucking chair, you know, yeah. the, um, the kind of poverty that's on display is really one of the things that's, uh, that's the most astonishing, you know, that kid takes the picture down in that scene and just the bunch of bugs crawling yeah. out. And, uh, it's as if everything in the entire movie has this kind of thick, filmy, scuzzy coating yeah. over it. It's, it's why I don't go in thrift stores. It's the... <laughs> I mean, it just feels gross to me. The worst is probably that black bathwater. Yeah. You know, that feels like by the time we get there, you don't even, you barely even notice it. Right. You, know, you have to stop and go, oh yeah, that is black bathwater, but it just seems so right at home with everything mm -hmm. else that's, you know, that we're around. It's the poverty mixed with, um, with alcohol, I guess. Yeah. That helps create a lot of that apathy that helps create wrestling the you know the cheap uh metal chair or whatever that scene so apparently when they filmed that scene none of the creators of the movie were around for it they kind of just threw all the actors in a room gave them some cameras and told them to have at it uh -huh. wanted to just create natural moments but a lot of the techniques they're using to create these natural moments makes this feel i mean if we can look at this as a reminder that this place exists and these people exist and they're a product of things that live inside every fucking human being, mm -hmm. then the way you really hit that home is to make it look as natural and real as possible. Right. Make it look, uh, you know, as close to documentary as possible, even more so than documentary. Because when you have a documentary, you think about, oh, there's the layer removed of the people who are making it looking sure. in. This is just, it's a documentary made right. by the people who live there, you know, and that makes it fucking scary. That kind of poverty doesn't always have to be gross and disgusting, though. Yeah. You have... Zeph, you have, yeah, you have posh and poverty, side. which is my favorite new thing. Of yeah, all time. I know you're giddy to talk about this. I am, and maybe it's just the albino in the film that's making me think about <laughs> it, or the harmony Corinne. I've had this recent fascination with albinos. I don't uh -huh. know why it's a fucking aesthetic thing. Is it a is it a uh, Da Vinci Code thing? It's definitely not a Da Vinci Code thing. That's okay. one thing we can rule out. You know, we mentioned previously on the show. Um, the word or yeah. Diane word, the South African group. Do you yeah. want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I, I think we didn't really yeah. touch on it a we lot got, in the year end. Well, they started off as just, you know, a rap group, mm -hmm. um, out of South Africa. And, um, this is before doing stuff with Harmony Korine. Right. This is before doing stuff with Harmony Korine. But after, have you, have you heard of, about all the, um, previous projects that they did yeah i'm aware of them i haven't gotten yeah. into any of that yet so deont is this fantastic piece of art it's i mean basically it's rap rave now their yeah. new record sure. has brought on sure. the term rap rave it's basically ghetto fair but it's uh from south africa where poverty is actually poor yeah instead of um south central la sure where poverty is kind of a bummer yeah right <laughs> right <laughs> um yeah, they're this they're this art fantastically artistic rap duo have a wonderful grasp on how rap is and how sure. rap is perceived. Sure. And um they constantly get shit for whether or not it's performance art. Sure. Um, there's been a lot of talking about how Ninja, the front man, all the previous projects, he was not gangsta at all. Ah. Not even a little. He used to wear suits. Sure. He used to be very um, I can see that. That doesn't surprise yeah, me. Yeah, he all. used to be very well spoken. All of their the rap was really articulate, you know, sure. trying to make a difference type rap. And eventually he just said, fuck this. This isn't working. I'm <laughs> sure. going in from the inside. 
Ninja comes out and he he once stated in an interview, um, Ninja is like Superman to Clark Kent. Right, right. Only I never take the fucking cape off. Sure, sure. Um it's perfect because so it's you know, it's these two people. Yeah. They're from it's South Africa. It's three people. Yeah. It's it's Ninja, Yolandi Visser, and DJ High Tech. Oh, of course, DJ High Tech. Yeah, he'll fuck I, you in the ass. How could fuck I white boy. Forget. Uh, if people haven't heard these albums, there's, I think, Tensions. Tension. I, I mean, Tensions sure. where it's at. That's that came out in start February. You, um, you work yeah, back. February 2012. Well, the duo, I mean, they uh, resemble, it, it's as if some kids in South Africa had found a bunch of rap magazines. Yes. You know? But when you compare that to, say, L.A. Poverty or, let's say, Uptown uh, Double yeah. Feature Studio Poverty, I mean, here we can work off a budget, sure. or in LA you can work off a budget. You live paycheck to paycheck, but you make decisions about what to buy. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about African levels of poverty, South Africa is probably a little bit better off yeah, than it's far most better. of Africa. And it's not all Zef. Yeah. I mean, that's just sure, that's sure. The, uh, that's the uptown to South Africa. <laughs> well, you think about, you know, you get some money, and it's not a. It's like you found a prize. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of oh, how do I pay my bills or ration out whatever. You're so poverty stricken that when you find money, it's a little reward you won. And this idea of Zeph is that uh, it's kind of a culture now where you basically you're in poverty, you have nothing, but when you acquire a sum of money, you use it for bling. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You use it for posh. It's this idea yeah. of posh and poverty. So every time you find a little thing you can achieve, you use it for fucking gold fronts or to bleach right. your hair. You know what I yeah. mean? You and use you, it on image. And, and you end up looking absolutely unique. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, the, it's an incredible aesthetic. The Zep really aesthetic is. is unprecedented. <laughs> it's amazing. In, in, um, in any visual sense, which is probably why Harmony Corinne was drawn to it. Yeah. So talk about that short a little bit. Yeah. So uh, Dion Word, they're not exclusively a musical group. They're a musical focus group, but they have a lot <laughs> a of musical focus group. I they love have that. a lot of film, video, music, video mm -hmm. ideas. And that's a big part of them. Right. As a performance piece. Sure. Um, and they work with other, you know, especially in South Africa, a, a lot of the artists kind of work at a, right. a, a collective. The, like in the Enter the Ninja video, mm -hmm. they had that um, that visual artist. Well, and I, I thank you, Freaky, too. I mean, right. all, all of those are... Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, you're right. Um, but they, they, it's, it's kind of subversive in the way that you can't figure out what they're subverting or how they're subverting <laughs> sure. it, but you know that most people aren't going to be okay with it. Sure. And that's, I think it's that rebel without a cause idea. Right. It's that subversion of, well, we don't really have anything to subvert, but we see culture over here doing it. Yeah. It's almost, almost a commentary on rap culture. Sure. Up to the point where it realizes a commentary on rap culture would be redundant and unnecessary. Yeah. So it's kind of just, it's its own unique thing. Yeah. You really just need to look at it. And so, yeah, um, Shini Wam is this short film that Harmony Corinne did. Um, and it's about these these two people, and they uh, they get pretty bling in wheelchairs, and there's <laughs> a lot of guns and a lot of nihilism, and a lot of heart. Yeah. Um. And it's it, yeah, it stars Ninja and Yolandi. I mean, you it's online. You can I'll find link it off online. to it. I'll link off to it. You know, we uh, it's kind of a nice note to end on with such a portrait of of hopelessness uh, with this movie, but. I want to look at the other side, too. I want to look at the Pink Flamingo side. Oh, that's a big side of it. Well, you have to have direct opposition to something like uh -huh. you know, what, what Chris Yeah, this is a good pair. It was. We have to make time to pat ourselves on the back again. I, I think, one, Pink Flamingos I'm excited to talk about because, finally, our constant conversations about the mainstream debate of where... Where John Waters mainstream branched off, whatever uh -huh. began. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's, I mean, this is deep in Dreamlanders territory. Yeah. We're nowhere. Although the argument could be made it's the most well known of the Dreamlanders films that's true. and thusly the mainstream <laughs> one, but I will not make that argument. The Dreamlanders I've referenced before on the show. That is the old school John Waters troupe that honestly, you know, made its way through a lot of his films. Yeah, and I love, I love, I always forget that they're called the Dreamlanders. And yeah. every time oh, isn't that the it, best? it makes me so excited. Yeah, because there's almost something ironic about it. But, sure. But not really. I no, mean, it's, it's dream and it's hard. Yeah, I feel like it's, I feel like it's this, it's not ironic, which is what I love about yeah, it. Yeah, you're it's, right. It's John Waters and his friends and they want to make movies and he <laughs> yep. wants to make movies. And so they're going to. And they're going to fucking make movies. Yeah. And they're going to make whatever movies they want and it works. Sure it does. <laughs> yes, it did. 
um, Mink Stoll, who, by the way, Mink Stoll, red hair in this movie, and maybe it's the other names that I'm going to drop. Mink Stoll's kind of the hot one. Yeah. Am I totally off like base that. on that? Mink Stoll. I never thought I'd say that, but... Yeah. Because Edith Massey is not the hot one. Ugh. Edith Massey is the egg lady. I have such a problem with that. I think of all yeah. the things that go on in this film, of all the, you know, different holes that sure. sing, <laughs> sure. of all the uh, different meats that are tied to different genitalia, yep. of all the different bodily matter that gets consumed, mm -hmm. egg lady... Somehow that a upsets baby you pen the most. Is the most uncomfortable. Uh, also, Divine can't, can't oh, go unrecognized. There'll be lots of Divine uh, chat. But John Waters is kind of. I think John Waters is narrating. That's John Waters, yeah, right? It's got to be. Yeah, I'm just having so much fun. I'm barely paying attention <laughs> to who's doing what. I had to pause several times to write things down this time. It um, Pink Flamingos is this this cult legend yeah. of a movie. It's something I was aware of way before I knew anything about John Waters. I mean, when's the first time you heard about this? Can you remember the first yeah, time? Yeah, I can. Yeah? When I first moved to the city and I met a bunch of people, we all went to Tower Records when uh, Tower Records and physical music right. were so both things that people could have. so this was 30 years ago. Right. And a guy that I had met and was kind of into film was trying... I, I, I wish I remembered the other film he almost bought. But he had might have another double feature on. Our he hands. had Pink Flamingos in one hand uh, and another film in another hand, and he was like, "I don't know which one of these to buy." Wow! And I was like, "Well, I've never seen either one." Sure. And then he holds Pink Flamingos and he goes, "Someone eats poop in this movie." <laughs> right. And I said, "You should get that one." Yep. So he bought it, and we immediately went home. Ooh. And we watched it, the whole group of us. Yeah. And I shit you not, Eric Ingram, by the end of the movie, there were three people left in the room. Wow. Yeah. It actually killed off the audience. Yes. Yeah. In a college dorm room, it wow. killed off the audience. These the are people is starving the only for movie. social attention. Yeah, I've ever seen to do that. That's, you know, I once described John Waters on our show as that perfect feel good, just kind of no matter where I'm at, I watch a John Waters movie and everything is just great yeah, in the world. Absolutely. And this is my first time seeing Pink Flamingos. Oh, really? I've, yeah, I have been saving Pink Flamingos for the better part of a decade. Oh my God. And you know, this happens once in a while where I have certain films that I know are going to be great uh -huh. and I'm going to watch them and it's going to be the, the best fucking moment of my life. Sure. And I don't watch them. I save right. them for when things get bleak and I yeah. go nuts. You did that with Drive. When I, I have a little mental relapse. Yeah. yeah. And uh, although that was shorter term. It was far shorter. Drive yeah. came out. No, I, but I, that's I the first on one I can think months. of. It, but yeah. Um, the Six Rocky I ended yeah. up having to do for the show. Yeah. But that was when I was kind of sitting on. And that's what happened with Pink Flamingos too. We put it off for a long time. One, because we were not sure we were ready to go into that old John Waters territory. Yeah. But secretly, I had just not seen Pink Flamingos. Yeah. And I've seen the other Dreamlander stuff. Sure. But uh, not all of it. But I mean, I'm familiar with it. And I just knew this would be so great. Yeah. And I just, I needed a rainy day movie. And then time came to do it on the show. And it's just as fucking well, perfect. as. Yeah. And this is what, this is touted as a trash show film still. Sure. Technically the trash show films. Well, yeah, that's what, um, when I think of the Dreamlanders movies, that's what I think of. Yeah. That's a, it's a self-given title to the early John Waters films, sure. including the film Mondo Trash Show. Yeah. Where John Waters just makes these movies. I mean, these are pretty heavily based on, um, well, we've talked about it before, but I love it. The newspaper articles. Oh, yeah, right. Where they fucking decide. You know, it's something that I wish I had the constitution to do. Sure. Go sure. out and go, I want to make a movie. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, Today. also, what should we do that about? Yeah, right. Um, for me, I'm always, well, I've got this idea and I'm going to start writing it. Sure. And then I forget, and, no, maybe that won't work. And right. then I forget it. I'm not doing that. Oh, but I got this other idea. And sure. all my scripts end up, you know, 40 pages. Yep. Uh, John and Waters goes, let's make a movie. Who's free today? Yeah. It's Saturday. So nobody's fucking working. Yeah. Divine is divine. Divine isn't working. <laughs> right. Uh, Divine's not working because we haven't come up with the movie idea yet. Right. So let's, I don't know, pull up a fucking newspaper, read some stupid article and yep. make a movie about it. Perfect. It's so, I mean, that's the best way to do stuff yeah. it, for me anyways. That's everything I've ever done that got finished was pretty much something I did the day of. I just yeah. went, you know what? I'm not doing anything today. Let's just fucking go do this thing. You and I made that video. We made, um, well, it was a music video. You were going to play a show anyways. Yeah, it that's true. It was the thing you were doing. 
and uh, and I was going to go to the show, and I said, oh, I'm going to bring a camera just make a music video mm-hmm. out of it. That's the only, which, by the way, that's called Porn Stars and Promises, <laughs> and you should go look it up. It's one of uh, the most viewed Glitter Mouse videos oh, on YouTube. I, I love that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, I mean, you just, you have to just go do things, and they look at the obstacle being, well, what do we do about plot? Uh, read a newspaper article. Okay, sure. let's move. Well, and and it's weird because... People will look at Pink Flamingo and go, so what happens in that movie? Most people will go, oh, no, someone eats poop. Yes. I know I keep saying that, yes. but that is the that's, reaction. You know, that's what I, I mean, I knew about Pink Flamingos back in fucking high school. It took me about 10 years to see the movie. And uh, it was one of those things like Faces of Death. Those were yeah. the two pieces of subversive right. you know, film that I, I knew about uh, when I was younger. And people talked about it as the poop movie. Right. That was it. You know? And it's such a small part of the film, but compared to Gummo... It's got a fucking story. Sure. I mean, it's sure, got a plot. It really compared to anything else, it's asshole dancing. Right. Compared right. to Gummo, it's about being the nastiest, filthiest person in sure. Baltimore. Well, it's the it's the competition for filthiest people yeah. alive, which really is the perfect plot for, you know, debauchery anything. on screen. But I mean, so we talked about that poop moment, which I love because it's just tacked on the end. Yeah. It's just such a... And then the thing you're about to see is Divine as an actor eating poop. Let's watch that now. Sure. And then Divine sees a dog and eats some poop, and then the movie ends. Yeah. And, I mean, it's... Uh, and it's so just, we'll put this on the end in case you questioned the... But is that... I mean, I've heard, and I don't know, because people say that Marilyn Manson got ribs removed to suck his own dick. Right. Um, also a thing I remember from when yeah. about about when this movie came out. Um, But color scales aside... Mm-hmm. I don't know to this day whether or not Divine actually ate that poop. I'm fairly confident that it's real poop and was okay. actually eaten. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that that's at least our stance. I know that it seems really childish to be really. <laughs> it does, but it's a you know on... it's a question they present. I mean, when you introduce the scene as you will now watch Divine eat poop, really it's poop, and really Divine will eat it, and then Divine eats some poop. I mean, naturally, yeah, that, that question might arise. It's, you know, it's great to go through. That's not one of the things that John Waters touches on in kind of the the bonus footage for this. Right. But there's a great special thing where he kind of gives a walkthrough of the uh, the missing scenes and so forth from this. There's the, if you've never seen the trailer, the trailer is really great from that. It's, uh, you ever seen the trailer from this movie? I don't think so. There is no footage from the movie and the trailer. Wow. It's just um, it's just people's reactions coming out of the theater. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. You make this movie and you go, we're gonna have, you know make this taboo movie, and it's it's impossible to show in theaters. It's impossible to rate. You know, no one will. It'll be banned everywhere. And then the, the trailer can't even include footage of the uh-huh. fucking movie. The fact that the studio even decided to make a trailer kind of makes me happy. The first thing I notice about this, um, you know, when I'm thinking about these newer John Waters films that have become a lot more pointed and uh, it's still some of the same actors and a lot of interesting acting choices. I say interesting really with with quotes around it. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of, I don't know, what do you call them? Taboo acting choices? You could always call the acting choices taboo or the the casting choices. Yeah, I think... It's, when Johnny Knoxville is the most professional actor. In, that's true. You know, that's where I'm going with this. But looking back at this, this is probably the worst acting we've seen since The Room. Oh, man. I mean, acting, I could say that pretty easily. That's definitely something you could call what's going on in this film. Well, because you're just making a movie with your friends. Yeah. You're having fun and you're learning how to make movies. And you're telling them the lines literally moments <laughs> right. before turning the camera on. Right, Okay, right. say eggy weggies. Oh, my God. The, uh, the simple decision not to take any of this seriously is what makes it different it's from true. the room that's you know the room we can we put that on the show as one of the rare times we've ever talked about a movie and just kind of tore it apart sure because it was bad no it was never serious so yeah that was like, okay well if it was never serious we're going to tear it sure. apart well that was the lisa that was tommy was always big thing oh it's a serious movie so you know we'll we'll handle it on that level but they look at this and you know everybody in the movie is just giggling every time the camera stops, sometimes even before the camera stops, and having a good time with it and that, you know, they're all aware they're terrible actors and it's just fun. And it's weird, you know, when you make that decision and you make it obvious you've made that decision on screen, that suddenly it doesn't matter how bad. In fact, the worse the acting gets, the better. Mm-hmm. 
Edith Massey is probably the worst actor in this movie. Yes, horrible. If not the, I mean, Edith Massey probably has trouble even functioning as a human being. Right. Uh, let alone on screen as a presence, which is the type of people John sure. Waters, you know, finds fascinating and puts in his movies. Sure. But uh, yeah, she can't, you know, she's just choking out these lines as if she has no comprehension of what she's talking mm-hmm. about. It's like hearing someone reading something off a page if that person can't read. That's yeah. basically how Edith Massey performs. But it seems unnecessary to even comment on the acting. The thing that was the most surprising about the, the sort of amateur quality of this was from John Waters, because he tends to be the most professional element of his films. Right. The fact that he knows what he's doing, and he's really got his finger on the pulse of his subject matter mm-hmm. and his actors, and he's just he has the right level of these things at all times. Right. But when we're watching this movie, I mean, he's learning how to make films. He's doing these, I mean, most of these scenes are a single take. Yeah. Not because it's a, a Joss Whedon, you know, Serenity show-off single take, but because he doesn't know that you shoot from multiple angles yeah. and edit together. He's making a fast, he probably knows that, but he's making a fast movie. Uh-huh. And every single scene is just turn the camera on, do the scene, then turn the camera off. That's what you do. And then you move to the next scene and you turn the camera on and you film it and you turn the camera back off. He's also doing, you know, he's got a zoom lens. So, of course, you use it because, uh-huh. you know, that's what you do with the zoom lens. And he's just zooming in and out of, oh, now we're going to focus on this person. Rather than cut to a close-up, I'll just zoom in on their face. Uh-huh. And then, up oh, somebody over there is talking quick. Zoom back out and then move back over to them and zoom in. It's what you do when, the, you know, the first time you ever touch a fucking camera. I'm going to give people a filmmaking tip that's awesome right now. If you suck at shooting uh, movies and your movies come out amateur looking, get what's called a fixed lens. Uh, a prime lens it can't zoom and then you just don't have that problem yeah because if you have a zoom lens you're always going to want to zoom into things and then your stuff is going to look hokey if you don't do it right and they're cheaper they're nice cheap lenses um the actors don't always fit in the frame i mean they're clearly not can it's just where can we put the camera to get the most stuff in here it's wonderful it really is i I mean it's wonderful because you see how far john waters has come if this is all he ever did then we'd be, well, we'd be talking about him like he's Herschel Gordon Lewis, Yeah, right? that's true. I mean, that was the magic of Herschel Gordon Lewis, is somebody who kept making films that never seemed to get better. Yeah. <laughs> they almost seemed to just get worse. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. And it's, you know, it's funny, too, because I think Herschel Gordon Lewis, I can see a lot of that in this movie. There's a lot yeah. of those kind of HGL-inspired moments, the cannibalism and stuff. A lot of our favorite filmmakers around this era are just people who... They do. They just turn on a fucking camera and go, okay, movie time. Yeah, right. But it makes me feel like anyone can do this. That's why I love it. Yeah, it's the best thing. I mean, especially when you know newer John Waters movies. Uh It was one thing to see it uh, just on its own. I mean, I don't know know what that was like because I saw the newer stuff. I'm not going to pretend I know what that was. fucking bizarre, and it made no sense. And I'm pretty sure the only reason I sat through it was because I had a deeper thirst for social acceptance than the people who left the room. (laughs) Sure, there you go. But... It you wanted to withstand the me. test. Yeah, yeah, and it, it was a it, dare. It probably affected me from a film standpoint, especially sure. in retrospect. Well, yeah, and you make the connection too. You see the later stuff. You see how far he's come and and how great his movies have become, uh, in their own right, rather than just as novelties. Right. And to go, this is where he started, and a famous piece of where he started makes me feel like, man, pick up a camera and get to yeah. work. Well, and it's so fucking hilarious because you take something like hairspray. Sure. Hairspray had this massive, you know, cult following, turned into a musical, turned into a massive, huge blockbuster film. And you know that anybody who loves Hairspray went back and saw the original Hairspray, then saw Crybaby, then saw Pink Flamingos. Because Pink Flamingos is the third one you see when you start with Hairspray. (laughs) Right. Because you're looking for the most popular John Waters movie. Sure, sure. And it's Hairspray. And then Crybaby is just the obvious What a terrible choice. tour of John Waters, by I the know. way. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. There are creative moments in this, too, though, that, you know, I, I we're talking about the movie so much. It's just, ha, ah, terrible thing John Waters made. But there are so many moments that where you see, you see a little bit of the genius poke through. Uh-huh. Moments like treating Divine like the blonde bombshell, you yeah. know, with the music and stuff. Sure. As if filmmaker not aware at all that, you know... Almost like he couldn't cast a blonde bombshell. Yeah. But, you know, Divine lives in this town. So uh, same exact movie, same script, same music choices. We're just going to put Divine in where we would have put 
I keep searching for a name in my head. Jessica Rabbit. And then there's the obvious moments of, you know, just pushing things as far as they could go. Cox That's sausage. what they had. Yeah, right. I mean, that kind of, yeah, that hot dog flasher thing, you know, just going as far further, uh, much further come sure. on, than anybody was willing to go. Yeah. That's where you see their, you know, their artistic genius coming mm -hmm. through early. It's the reason this has lived on in infamy, not just what John Waters has become, but that, you know, it had this cult status right away because it pushed things so far. It, uh, it kind of validated that thing that I talked about on the show before, you know, in a marketplace for artists who aren't or, or weren't yet skillful yeah. at their craft, but they were willing to do things other people weren't. Yeah. And they're just their willingness to go that far made them notable artists, even if they weren't make even if they made a film that fucking looked like Pink Flamingos. Right. You know, you could talk about the hot dog flasher or fucking a bloody chicken or, you know, all of these moments littered throughout the movie that are just so they burn themselves in your mind for the terrible, right. wonderful things they do. The foot fucking even comes to mind for not being that, you know, not being one yeah. of the more X rated scenes. Somehow sitting in a crib eating eggs is still about it's the worst thing so that the movie does. It's so fucked up, and it's it, so yeah. gross. I mean, I think that, and it, it, it is a reverse reflection on the film, is um, the obsession with just that one fucking thing. You just want yep. to just stop fucking yep. talking about it. And please <laughs> right. go away and yeah. stop bringing it up. Because but it's I'm, at home in a crib, and right. every time you go home, it's there. And that's basically, you know, that's a lot of what Pink Flamingos does to the viewer who doesn't get it. Yep. Is yeah okay. Stop being fucked up. Stop it. We get it. You're fucked up. Yeah, stop right. being fucked up. Uh -huh. But Eggs, the reality of the reality of the situation is, Pink Flamingos. It, it just it's fucked up. Yeah. It's just that. Like that's the purpose of the film. Is I mean the plot of the film. You know, it's the whole idea there is to upset people. And yeah. I don't mean to upset people from you know say a Deont word perspective. Sure. Um. It's it's in a fun way. It's it's calling it to question and laughing at you for being upset. Right. right. Um. It's going really. You're that upset over poop. Yeah. It's a butthole, yeah. guys. Come on. Well, I mean, you know, when I said the egg thing, somehow feels like the worst, but it feels like the worst until the asshole variety gag. Yeah. Uh, toward the end, I want to talk about that chicken scene a little okay. bit too, because we saw some animal abuse in the previous film. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, it's these people fucking and then a chicken kind of gets involved and it's pretty messed up. And, you know, you see this in movies from time to time and there's always a fucking statement that comes out and goes, oh, we didn't actually harm any animals, you know, in uh, Gummo, we're not harming any animals. In Pink Flamingos, they fucked a chicken. That's a thing that happened. Mm -hmm. That's not a fake stunt chicken that comes in at the end. They bought a chicken from a, a fucking place that kills chickens for you to eat, and then they fucked it, not to death. I want to say they fucked the chicken to death, but then the cast cooked and ate it. I mean, that was just what happened. So you're, you're watching this, and it gets even worse the more you know about yeah. the film, which is great because usually there's the cannibal holocaust thing. Sure. Of, Ah, oh, it's the worst thing ever. And then you go, no, 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 guys, it's movie making magic. Come on. Although there was a lot of the animal stuff in that yeah. too, but just thinking about like the cannibalism elements. Uh -huh. Maybe that was a terrible go to, but yeah. you know what I mean. You think about the bicycle seat. Exactly. You see somebody impaled or whatever, and you go, man, that's brutal. And then the filmmaker draws you a diagram of how they filmed it, and you go, oh, it's it's not that that's bad. Brilliant. It's people having fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here, there's there's no. I mean, they fucked a chicken. Sure. The right thing to do. It holds things like this up and it says, you know, they're not that bad. Uh, we yeah. ate the chicken. The chicken was going to get eaten anyways. Yeah. It wasn't that bad. You know, there's, uh, there's these moments of filth, but filth kind of, I mean, this is the perfect example of celebration. Filth kind of saves the day. Yeah. The flasher is scared off by a hermaphrodite. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, you know, it makes a joke. It's lighthearted, but simultaneously makes the situation another level of fucked up. Yeah. The only other thing I guess I really wanted to ask you about is how the fuck do we get to the end of this movie? Me as a new viewer. And it turns out there's still a trial. There's still yeah, a goddamn yeah, trial. Always a trial. The the, not a John Waters movie unless you end <laughs> on a trial. Um, more trials at doublefeatureshow.com. You can email us, uh, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Tell us where you were when you first heard about Pink Flamingos. Not when you saw it, but when you first heard about it. And then if that shortly followed with you seeing it, or it took you a long time, or you never saw it. you just chaptered to hear. Yeah, Right. Uh, if you listen to Gummo and Chapter to Hear, uh, tell us something about humanism 
or uh, Die Out Word. Next time we're going to do some good old-fashioned Rodriguez Tarantino double featuring. The <laughs> one you've been waiting for since the beginning of time. The and Faculty is, oh. and Jackie Brown. That's But that's not a Watch more fucking film. Bye.